first up, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased that we're going to have a very distinguished panel talking about the media. It is going to be facilitated by Lynn Malcolm. Um, I might ask our speakers just to come up as I'm introducing them. Now, Lynn. Lynn Malcolm, as you would all know, I'm sure, um, is the host to ABC Radio National Weekly program, All in the Mind, which covers brain and mind science, psychology, mental health issues. She's also been the executive producer of Radio National Science Unit for almost two decades. She's got a degree in psychology, education and anthropology from Sydney University and a graduate diploma in journalism and communications from the University of Technology. Low achiever is what I'm saying. Um, she's received a number of awards for her work in radio, including the 2014 Mental Health Matters Media Award for All in the Mind. And something you may not know wasn't in her bio, but I managed to get out of her. Massive Nick Cave fan. Huge. Not exactly relevant, but I just thought you'd want to know. Um, she does make her friends listen to it. Please welcome Lynn Malcolm. <laughs> now, next up is Chris Taylor. Chris, you can make your way up, please, sir. He's, uh, I'm sure, known to all of you. A writer, director, performer, best known as a member of the Chaser team. Chris is responsible for TV programs such as The Chaser's War on Everything, CNN, NNNNNNNNN, and The Hamster Wheel on ABC TV. He's presented radio shows on Triple J, including Drive Program Today Today, and the ARIA award-winning comedy series The Blow Parade. Um, he's also a very keen amateur astronomer, not to be confused with astrologer, or he'll be very cross with me. And he's got a feeling that there's a lot of stuff out there. That's pretty much all I could get out of him <laughs> about the astronomer thing. It did seem odd, I'm going to be honest. Um, next up, Bjorn Stewart. Where are you, Bjorn? There you are. He's an actor who trained at the University of Wollongong with a Bachelor of Creative Arts. Bjorn featured in the highly acclaimed sketch series Black Comedy and the award-winning drama series Red Fern Now, one of the best things that's ever been on Australian television, may I say. In Theatre, Stewart was directed under Leah Purcell in Belvoir Street, um, in Belvoir Street Theatre's Brothers Rec and has worked with Australia's leading Indigenous theatre company, is it Ilbidri on Corrindurk? On Corrindurk. Um, what I managed to find out about Bjorn, and this will shock you, just take him in. His spirit animal's a bear. <laughs> then we had a debate among the cast about whether a koala bear is actually a bear. I'm saying it is. They're saying it's not. Um, but I've got the microphone. <laughs> Next up, ladies and gentlemen, is Faye Jackson. Faye Jackson is a deputy commissioner at the New South Wales Mental Health Commissioner. Um, Faye has experienced symptoms of mental health issues since age 10. And despite doctors telling her she would never hold down meaningful work or be a contributing member of society, Faye has fought back to become an accomplished artist, public speaker, trainer, service director and CEO of her own company. You told them. Uh, Faye was one of the first people in Australia to regularly speak as a consumer of mental health services at public events and she emphasised the potential of people with a lived experience of mental illness and the importance of their contributions. Most importantly, Faye taught Ben Harper to surf. Um, for those of you who don't know him, uh, apparently he's got a large bottom and that makes it difficult to surf and Faye managed to get around that. So, <laughs> I don't know why that's not on her bio. Ladies and gentlemen, your media and arts panel. Thank you very much and lovely to be here with the esteemed panel. Um, look, I thought we'd start by getting straight into it and asking the question, we've made some progress with, um, in the areas of um, reduction of language in casual racism, um, with sexism, with homophobia. Have we made as much progress in the area of mental health? So I just wondered if we could go quickly through uh, uh, for an opinion from each of you. So, Chris. No, I would say, but, um, but I would also say um, the historical transgressions when it comes to race, uh, sexuality, and uh, what was the other one you just said? Um, racism, sexism, homophobia. Sexism, um, homophobia and, and racism. The systemic and cultural oppression of people of colour or of females, I'd argue historically has been greater um, than of people who suffered mental illness. I, I sort of see us as almost getting to a point as a society of correcting the wrongs of those 
first that you mentioned, and now I, I'm kind of hopeful that having recognised the mistakes of the past in regards to race and gender, we get better at recognising um, language transgressions and, and offensive language. So, um, yeah. So the path is laid out perhaps that it might be easier in this area? I think so. Mm, great. Bjorn, what do you think? Um, whoa. <laughs> He's the bear. <laughs> <laughs> just hit me right in the face. Um, I'm going to have to disagree, actually. I, um, I find that we haven't quite come as far as we hoped we would with racism, sexism, uh, homophobia, um, and also the languages around mental health as well. Um, it's, um, but in saying that, that, there probably hasn't been much emphasis on the languages surrounding mental health um, as much as there has been a discussion around uh, the other topics. Um, so, it w yeah, it would be good to see, um, you know, that there's discussions that are being brought forward to um, bring those into light. But in terms of society, I don't think that we're getting um, close to it, not to be a wet blanket or anything. Um, I experienced uh, racism recently, probably a couple of weeks back, blatant racism, um, and a lot of my um, friends and family experience it on a daily basis, and it's uh, and also sexism as well, um, and it's and homophobia. Yeah, I'm, I'm listing all of them, just ticking all the boxes. <laughs> yeah. So I think what um, I'm sorry, your mind's, oh, yeah. I think mine's not working. I, I certainly wasn't wanting to give the impression we'd we'd cracked those issues. Um, what, what I was saying was that there'd been political movements to address them, the civil liberties movement in America, um, the, the huge feminist movement uh, throughout the 50s and 70s that were actively campaigning to correct the wrongs that, that do exist in those territories. I don't think mental health has an equivalent movement yet, but I do think we are just starting to have that public conversation in a way that we have been conversing about sexism and racism for longer. I'm not saying we've cracked those things, but I think we've been a more mature society to at least begin that discussion, whereas mental health, I think we're only real in the infancy of that conversation. Mm. Agreed. What about you, Faye? How far ha have we come, do you think, in, in the realm of mental illness? Well, I, yeah, I don't think we've begun. Well, the, the people who are in, who are already in it, are the community, my community of brothers and sisters who have lived experience, um, it's a big conversation for us, but um, you just have to turn the radio on and, and you hear, like politicians, if politicians are going to be calling, you know, so the shooter in, um, in the Link Cafe, Baird, the Premier, did not say crazy man or lunatic, he didn't even say that he was a um, terrorist. But Abbott, and what's Abbott's opposition? Shorten. As soon as they, yeah, they're both on the same side, really. As soon as they got onto the media about it, it was, I actually heard them say, you know, this madman. And one of them said, and I can't remember which one, and probably they both did, these crazy, there's a lot of crazy people out there doing this kind of thing. We've got to protect, you know, Australians from that. That's just bullshit. And there's a big difference between bad and mad. And it's time that we claimed back badness as well because the, 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 I do think that we've med medicalised human conditions and we've taken away badness and made it madness and that's crap too. There's bad people and just as there's people who don't, who, who aren't nuts that are bad, there are also people that are nuts that are bad, you know. So, so some of the words, some of those words that, that you're using, um, they're often, they're quite commonplace words. They are. Um, and Perhaps are they, you know, perhaps they're used lightly. Is, I mean, is it a possibility that we just ask people not to use those words? I think that it, we, re, I think that we really should have a standard for politicians and the media uh, to start with, um, to not use those words in that way. I mean, those of us that, um, my brothers and sisters, and uh, um, and I include my transgender and intersex brothers and sisters in that. Um, my brothers and sisters. 
we, we use our language amongst ourselves the way we do. And we laugh, we laugh at each other, you know, like, I, oh, my God, I thought I was going to be sacked about this. When I was a director in um, the mental health service, there was one lady that used to come in quite regularly and she was really addicted to trying to kill herself, but it also addicted to the feeling of coming out of the near, the near death experience. It was amazing. And, and um, one day she was in, I, I saw her and I said, oh, darling, you're in again. She said, yes. And I said, oh, what did you do this time? She said, um, deodorant. And I said, what? And she said, deodorant. I said, what do you mean deodorant? She said, I, I inhaled deodorant. And I really thought this time I'd done it, but I didn't get it right again. And I, and I just looked at her and said, oh, well, never mind, darling. At least you don't have bad breath. Now, I thought I'd be sacked, but she found it really funny as well and laughed at it, you know, thank God, and we were laughing. And, and that's something that we can do with each other, you know, but it, it's like people don't make Steady Eddie jokes, you know, at Steady Eddie, you know, but we're, we're happy to, if, if, if being, using that language will make us more inclusive, will be, make us more included, mm. then okay. That's okay, but yeah. it's not if it's excluding us, and it is excluding us at the moment. So, Bjorn Stewart, um, as a writer and an actor, how have you walked that fine line between laughing with people and laughing at them? I laugh at people all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's... Um, with, with my experience on black comedy, um, you... You know, in comedy in general, you have that uh, liberty to be able to bring up those awkward questions and um, hold society, I guess, at ransom with um, and putting these um, social cues at hold, at stake, and saying, like, what do you guys think about this, you know, or what do you think... Um, bring satire into it and, you know, the putting the majority on the platform as well and going, you know bringing those topics forward. Um, so I think that, yeah, walking that fine line, it's about um, providing a space for people to be able to reflect, uh, laugh at, and allow to laugh at, um, and bring out conversation. And the funny thing was, when we did black comedy, was how many people became quite um, politically invested into the mm. show and thinking, what did it mean? And when we were writing it, we were just being silly and making funny jokes. But coming across, there was another layer to that as well that people were trying to bring out of it, um, which was great. It brought about a lot of conversation about what racism meant and what that... Um, and could we laugh at it as mm. well? Yeah. There's a sense, too, that... Um in, in a lot of ways, you, you're laughing at yourself in front of people. Um, and it seems to be okay for you to make jokes about yourselves and laugh about yourselves, but it's the same jokes are not okay to be made by others. Do you think that um, this type of humour is helpful in breaking down the stigma? Um, I think there were jokes that were um, directed at community as well, that, yeah, that we could laugh at ourselves. Um, and it comes with that experience as well, like have you um, lived that life and have you led that life to be able to understand what that meant? Um, and yeah, some you know, to uh, throw that out there, uh, some people that haven't had that same experience probably might get in trouble with people doing that to um, an Aboriginal community. But yeah. Um, it's a, it's a fine line, isn't it? Yeah, mm. yeah. But I, I thought that was... I loved that um, program, that series. It was... Fa I just loved it. And it made me... Like, I don't see myself as um, racist uh, against Aboriginal people. But... But... No, no. <laughs> <laughs> but no offence. But... Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I was going to say... <laughs> <laughs> but when I was watching it, I went, oh, my God, 
I've been that patronising as well. You know, like you think you're not, you think that you're one of the goodies, and then you realise how damn patronising you are. You know, and I, and I think that's that's absolutely what it is too. I, I find that all the time. People who think that they're being really supportive of people with lived experience, you know, and really what they're doing is patting us on the head, you know, um, and 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 people people are so wanting to support us, that they can't laugh at us. And I think it's important, you know, like I say, you know, which I probably should have said to put all of those of you who've never seen me speak before, I should have made them feel better about my shake. I'm not this nervous. <laughs> I, I shake because of my lithium. I take lithium and, and I've come to see lithium as a friendly drug. You know, it waves, <laughs> make, <laughs> makes a good cup of tea, good martini. And I did this in a boys' school talk once, and I'll never do that again. <laughs> so, you know, and that being able to make it safe for people to laugh at me makes it safe for them to find out about what this is really like instead of patting me on the head. Mm. So, Chris, Chris Taylor, you often walk a very dicey line with comedy. How do you know... How far is too far to go? Oh, look, oh God. Um, I've really got a mic now. Um, you don't. Um, having done this for 12 years or so, the only thing I've learnt about questions of offensiveness and taste and boundaries is that everyone's is different. Um, something that you find offensive, I won't find offensive and vice versa. So it's very hard to make a universal call on these things. You can't, and, and what a show like Black Comedy showed, which I also loved, was, um, was that sometimes taking people out of a comfort zone isn't such a bad thing. Sometimes being offensive isn't such a bad thing. No one really has a, a God-given right to not be offended. I really do believe that. It, it kind of, I kind of get quite exhausted when you pick up newspapers every day and someone's always offended about something. Um, and, it's, and it's often something that's not, you know, catastrophically offensive, but just something that's slightly put them out or slightly inconvenienced their sensibility. That said, um, in the context of the sorts of things we're talking about tonight, um, I, I, I'm also not a believer in, in sort of carte blanche free speech. This has been a very pertinent political debate recently with, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the racial... A discrimination bill, which Brandis and his cohorts wanted to change to make it not illegal to vilify people on the basis of race. Um, it's the Andrew Bolt uh, clause, as, as they call it. And, and a, a lot of free speech advocates um, said it, we should remove those restrictions on us so we, we should be able to vilify people or offend people on the basis of race or on the basis of mental illness. And I don't think that's true. Um, Did you say vilify or abilify? Vilify. <laughs> um, I actually think some restrictions on free speech are good and necessary for a healthier society. I don't think people who are powerless or in a minority position or who don't have the advantages of the elite should be able to be slammed um, in a way. So I actually don't mind some checks on free speech. In terms of comedy, um, look, it, it, it's, as I said, it's a very personal thing. Um, you're talking to someone from The Chaser that has, as you said, made a career out of being deeply insensitive on a range of um, very delicate issues. And sometimes I think we've got it right, frequently we've got it wrong. Um, and I'm no wiser for having made good decisions or bad decisions. All I know is that it's going to be different every time. The best thing you can do in, in terms of uh, tonight's discussion about mental illness, which I think is a really interesting one. I, I was actually part of um, the ABC mental as a uh, week of programming last year and took part in the, the Friday Night Cracker, which was a, a sort of a, it wasn't a telethon, but you, you, I did, people would have seen it, I presume. It was a, a sort of good old-fashioned variety show. And I thought that was the closest example I'd seen in, in recent mainstream programming of getting the tone pretty right. It wasn't one of these sort of worthy nights to go, oh, these poor people, let's, um, what can we do for them? It sort of took the piss. And the great thing about people with mental illness is a lot of them have really good senses of humour. They, they are more open to the idea of taking the piss. But I do agree with some of the things being said here is you kind of need, to, for the people 
at the heart of the issue to take the lead, to sort of set the bar mm. about what they feel comfortable with, what they think is permissible in terms of comedy, and then those of us who might not um, suffer directly from it sort of take their cue, but also take their permission and just find out, is it okay for us to make jokes about this? And we did a piece that was reasonably... Um, it was sort of, it wasn't dark, but it was a little bit irreverent. And we got wonderful, overwhelmingly supportive feedback from the mental health community that it, it, it didn't tread on eggshells, but sort of took a more, um, a more edgy approach. Mm. So I just wonder, Bjorn, how powerful do you think um, the arts is in being able to um, reduce stigma? Very powerful. Um, with comedy with performance theatre. Um, it, I did a show uh, called Brothers Wreck that was at Belvoir Street Theatre and it dealt with the after effects of a suicide attempt, uh, no, a suicide and the after effects it had on family and friends and how we can deal with that. And, um, and I think in a lot of communities, uh, and in particular with the uh, Indigenous community, there is uh, a lot of uh, lack of communication with how one feels and, um, and about the situation. It's all about putting on a strong front, because you need that. Uh, and having this um, story that, um, about somebody dealing with um, that issue, um, and knowing that it's okay to talk and it's, there's nothing wrong with you if you are feeling um, alone and, um, you know, and reaching, and reaching out to a fellow human being. Um, that brought an amazing response with our audience, um, just knowing that uh, we played that to a, a high, uh, to a couple of high schools and uh, the response was, a, uh, was amazing. Um, the kids really engaged with it. Um, and connected to it as well. Uh, so, yeah, to answer your question, yeah, it's, um, the arts does play a very powerful part in um, allowing that communication and discussion to come forth. Mm. I don't think we've got very long, but um, Faye, I just wondered we, if we could start with you to get an idea from each one about what would one simple suggestion be um, to really make a to use language and, and to use a, a change in the way we talk about mental health, to, to really make a difference. Well, I think to, I think to start being strengths using strengths language and strengths focused and recovery focused. Oh, sorry, strengths language, strengths focused, recovery focused, ability focused, not uh, you know possibility focused. Um, but the language needs to so start with the with the politicians and with the media. But it certainly also needs to start within the services as well. But in the paper, you know, you, you read the mentally ill, you know, like we're, we're categorised, we're this big lump of disease, the mentally ill, you know, and, and I'm, a, I'm a bipolar, you know. Well, I've had cancer and I've never been called a cancer, you know. Like, don't call me a bipolar, I'm Faye. And I've, I, I, if, if you accept the medical model, I have bipolar you know, um, and I take medication. But I'm a whole bloody lot more than that, you know. And it just makes me so angry that, that they say, the schizophrenics, and schizophrenics like this, and, and Pete's a schizophrenic. Well, no, he's, you know, or he's schizophrenic, you know. And somebody told me today that they're, when they were moving from one part of the hospital to the other part of the hospital, they were there for a heart condition. When they saw the... Um, paperwork that went with them from one department to the other department, it said transfer schizo. You know, like that's still ab absolutely happening now, alive and well, you know, um, and, and it's, it's really discriminating. And, so, and last year I saw a doctor and he just, when he saw that I was on lithium, he just wanted nothing to do with me and, when I, and I, he said, you don't work. I said, I do, I'm um, Deputy Commissioner and General Manager of the Conclusion didn't write down delusional. I got out my cards. I got out my cards and pushed them to him and he said, anybody can print cards. You know, so it's absolutely alive and well now. Yeah, but that's a, a really strong example of how powerful words can be. I can see how hurt 
you were by some of those yeah, words. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but then in, in the other hand, we're, my little grandson, I have um, a 10-year-old and 7-year-old grandsons, and we talk to them differently about, you know, having lived experience and um, uh, because my, my, one of my daughters does, and, you know, um, and, and he looks me up. Which, which is scary. He looks me up on Google and found me doing talks, you know, and Nana's really famous and everything. And we were having this, we were kicking a, playing a game of football down Newtown um, Street with a pizza box, as you do. And, um, and we, then we all piled into the car. There were seven of us and, and my, my son-in-law and everything. We started driving away and my son-in-law said, we've got to try and be no more normal. I used to be normal until I got into this family. And my grandson just put his hands over his face and laid down on the seat and said, no, I don't want to be normal. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So I, 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 think that, I think that there's absolutely a way of us utilising language and having a sense of humour about it. It's a, it's a very powerful thing, you mm. know, so. Chris, one simple, single thing about the change in the way we use that language. Well, I'm going to answer the question slightly differently. Rather than um, address the way we should talk, I, I just think we need more talk. Mm. Um, I think we just need to talk about this more often um, to bring the sort of the panel discussion back to where we started. I think where we did see tremendous progress in, in civil rights uh, women's rights and gay rights was these political movements and, and members of the community speaking up, marching publicly, making it an issue. Um, that's why I feel optimistic because I do think that is a conversation we're beginning to have. Nights like tonight are absolutely brilliant. Um, but it, 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 it's not a conversation that can just be had internally in the industry. Um, it, it needs to be something that our politicians, our media, and just us amongst our friends in the pub on a Friday night, we need to talk about our illnesses, our problems, and our friends' illnesses. And when we normalise it is when we'll start finding the solutions. Mm. And beyond the future for you? Um, yeah, a lot of everybody's kind of, like, covered. Um, no, but I think what really resonated uh, for me is, yeah, it's, it's uh, communicating... Uh, within our respective communities. Uh, what Nelly stated before is that is to be open and uh, uh, with people that do have um, illnesses to be uh, accepting of it and to, um, and to seek help and to be, you know, comfortable in that, yes, this is me and this is who I am and to be, and for other people uh, from outside the community to be accepting of that as well. So, yes, it's all about open communication. Mm. Great. Especially with the different cultures, it's a really big, it's a really big issue with different cultures, and that's something we really need to address a lot more as well. Mm, mm. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you to our fabulous panel. Um, Faye, I have uh, one little quote that you might want to take away with you. Has anyone heard Jodie Foster talk about being normal? It's a fantastic quote. She says, um, she says the, the, job, the true job of the artist is to remind people that being normal is nothing to aspire to. I think you've raised a good grandson there. Well done.